All right, well, welcome back everybody to the second of these lectures on the basics of economic regulation. In this uh, lecture, we're going to be talking about a couple different things. Uh, again, it's the second, so we're really just getting started on this topic. Um, but today we want to talk a little bit about regulation and how it exists at different levels of the government. So, you know, state, local, federal in the case of the United States. We're then going to talk a little bit about the regulatory process, particularly in the United States, but the ideas are fairly standard ac across most developed nations. And then third, and, and finally, we're going to introduce some of the tools of regulatory design. First off, we should understand that, that not all regulation occurs at the federal or the national level. Okay. Uh, we can, of course, have regulation in the United States at what we call the state level, which are 50 states in the United States, each of which has its own somewhat different rules, regulations, and indeed regulatory agencies. And then third, we can also have regulation at the local level. So in, in this case, this is the, in, in my case, right, this is the city in which I live, right? So that's the city of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, has its own uh rules and regulations. Uh, there are some advantages uh, to being able to have regulation occur at different levels of government. So, for example, if we consider sort of the costs and benefits of a given regulation, you know, what what are the costs of imposing this regulation, then to whom do the benefits go and, and how much are they? Well, in, in many cases, like let's say we're regulating transit a city's costs and benefits, a large city's costs and benefits of public transit or limitations on private transit are going to be significantly different than they are in more rural areas. And enacting regulation at more local levels of government gives us the flexibility to sort of put things where they're needed. The second reason or second sort of positive of being able to have regulation occur at different levels of government is that you can create a, a sort of set of preferences where people can sort of locate where the regulatory structure that they prefer exists. So uh, people who prefer, say, again, a more regulated transportation network, more public transport, or people who prefer um, certain aesthetic requirements of business, or people who require or prefer certain distribution of income in the form of higher minimum wages, so on and so forth, folks can sort of locate where where those regulations exist. Uh, finally, then, uh, one, a final advantage of having regulation at, at multiples of levels of government is that we can uh, have the potential for innovation. In other words, we can sort of use the different locales as a laboratory to see sort of what's working to get the kind of outcomes that we desire and, and what isn't working. Um, economic theory is going to give us some ideas about what we would think would work and what wouldn't work, uh, but to actually try it out, try out this policy there, try out this policy there, see which gets the outcome, uh, and then we can enact the sort of functional policy at, at a higher level of government. Having talked then a little bit about the advantages of having regulation at different levels, you know, sort of what what are the you know why wouldn't we always <laughs> have local regulations then well <clears throat> uh there are there are several right we can kind of see them over here on the other side of the screen uh, federal or national uh regulations uh those agencies are going to be better staffed better funded uh just just because of the the size of funds that can contribute to them okay uh, and they're almost certainly going to have uh, information advantages over smaller regulatory agencies. Okay. Um, they're also likely to have at their disposal more effective tools for enforcement when compared to local or state, in the case of the United States, regulatory authorities. It's of course, again, going back to the advantage, people can move around to sort of choose, right? So if you can all sort of choose your regulatory environment, that might end up creating problems, especially for something like air quality, which you know air moves pretty easily from 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 one city to the, the one next door. Okay, 
The second, right, is that, that national regulation is generally more efficient, okay, for most firms. So if we think about, like, say, product safety regulation, where we require products to have certain attributes, you know, maybe we put a cap on it that's hard for kids to get off, we require that or something like that. If you do that at the local level, what you end up doing is you end up imposing a variety of different cost structures on large national or international firms. Uh, examples of this uh, are are easy to see in say automobiles where you know different in this case it's different nations have different standards right but you'll see automobiles in one market will be constructed with one set of safety standards and then in another market they'll be constructed with another set of safety standards and of course that imposes a variety of costs onto auto producers that they wouldn't otherwise have to bear okay um, <clears throat> Third, okay, you know, a lot of problems, and now particularly we're talking about environmental problems, you know, they can occur locally, but they have these sort of widespread ramifications. So, you know, we think about like air pollution, right? <laughs> if my city enacts some air pollution requirements, well, the next city's only, you know, 15 kilometers away. Uh, certainly, in a relatively short period of time, any polluted air from here could, could easily drift there. Uh, even the next state here in the United States is only 70 miles away uh, and certainly the air uh, does move quickly uh, uh, that far, right? So <clears throat> anyway, then finally, you know, there are some standards that we sort of believe just should, should be adhered to on a national level that reflect national values. So for example, child labor, right? Sort of we've, we've as a nation, right, we've sort of decided, okay, well, little kids shouldn't shouldn't be working in factories, <laughs> uh, and 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 that's that's the decision that we've made at the national level, and so policy uh, should reflect that at the national level. Now, to add to all this confusion, uh, regulatory agencies can exist at multiple levels, right? That we can have a state regulatory agency with a certain name and federal or national as well, right? So, of the ones listed over here. Um, you know, HHS is Health and Human Services, DOT is Department of Transport, EPA is Environmental, Protect Pro Environmental Protection Agency, OSHA, Occupational, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Okay, these are all acronyms you're going to know by the end of the course off the top of your head. Okay, but if we take like DOT, Department of Transportation, um, there's of course in my state Wisconsin there's Wisconsin DOT right and then there's also the the national DOT Department of Transport uh, and they regulate different types of activities different things with regards to transportation okay uh, similarly uh, health and human services right this is health and human services actually exists uh, in the US at the federal state and even local level right so there's all different health and human services agencies that uh, regulate different aspects of uh, and, and overlap as well I shouldn't shouldn't suggest it's mutually exclusive uh, those areas right so they regulate those areas all right so then moving on to a little bit about how a regulation occurs or sorry how it sort of plays out right we need to first understand the difference between regulation or the law, right, and the rules that apply to the regulation. Okay. Okay. So, for example, the law might say, you know, it, the air will be clean, and then the Environmental Protection Agency says, okay, well, that means we're going to monitor air quality at a variety of sites, and we're going to issue fines for anybody who pollutes more than amount X. Okay, so the former would be the law, right? And then the latter would be the rules issued by the regulatory agency. So how does that sort of work? Does the regulatory agency just get to issue whatever rules it feels like? No, obviously not, okay? It follows the procedure that we see over here on the left-hand side of the screen. Now, I'm not gonna go through every step of this, uh, but we should understand that on the left side is a regulatory agency. So this might be like the EPA or it might be OSHA, right? Occupational Safety, or it might be the Department of Transport. And then the Office of Management and Budget is an executive branch office in the United States. That's 
under the President of the United States that, uh, well, it does a couple things. Its, its main function is to produce the uh, uh, executive branch budget proposal, right? Um, but its its other function is to sort of over, over, well, it has a few other functions, but its other function with regards to what we're talking about is to sort of oversee this rules making process. In other words, it is there to ensure that the rules making process occurs in a manner that's consistent with the law and with broader policy. Okay, so <clears throat> here we can see that a rule will go back and forth between the regulatory agency and the Office of Management and Budget a couple different times. And there's, there's two slides in this, right? This is the first half of the process. We can see that this first half of the process then ends with public notice and comment, right? So before these rules get put into place, uh, there is, you know, public notice, right? So, so businesses that are going to be affected by this, individuals are going to be affected by it, you know, have, have uh, a time period to reflect and to uh, comment on the likely impact of these rules. So here we see the sort of second half of this procedure, right? Uh, and then we note that it concludes with both the potential for uh, legislative branch review, which is Congress in the United States, right? Or these, this is the body that makes the laws. Uh, and then also, of course, the potential for judicial rule, that is to make sure that the rules are consistent with the uh, already existing laws of the nation. Right? Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the relationship of regulatory agencies and the Office of Management and Budget, okay, which as I mentioned earlier, uh, it sort of is, provides primary oversight for these agencies. Okay. Generally speaking, right, the, the OMB will approve uh, regulations and the rules associated with those regulations. Okay. Um, indeed, in recent years, uh, so this is 2021 that I'm speaking to you from. In recent years, uh, this has been. Well, I shouldn't say that because actually, in the last few years, it was it, there was some increase, right? But but the the trend over the last you know decade or so, generally speaking, had been for less and less. Uh, rejections of these rules uh, and you know you might say oh well this shows that it's a rubber stamp or something like that no uh, what what it tells you is that the regulatory agencies have a pretty good idea about what any given OMB is going to approve or reject right and so what they do is they're going to write the rules in such a way that they believe that they're going to gain OMB approval right so if OMB is indicating a more conservative direction, um, the regulatory agencies are going to write the rules in such a way that they're more consistent with the uh, current, say, more conservative uh, administration. And conversely, uh, if 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 the OMB is moving in more of a liberal direction, then the regulatory agencies are going to write the rules accordingly. Right. So we should recognize that sort of there's a bit of a, a game going on here, if you will, between different organizations, and it's in everybody's interest, the OMB as well as the regulatory agencies, it's in both their interests to design rules that are um, consistent with broader policy objectives. Similarly for judicial review, right? Uh, again, regulatory agencies are not. If you imagine, put yourself in the, some, in the shoes of an economist working in a regulatory agency who's designed, trying to design a set of rules uh, associated with a given regulation. Um, you know, you've got to show up at work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You know, you're not going to write a bunch of rules, spend your work day uh, doing work that you know that somebody else is going to throw out. Okay, uh, it just doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so what you do is 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 you, is you try to read folks folks what they're willing to accept, um, whether it be uh, OMB from the executive branch or it be judicial review from the legislative branch, and uh, similarly you're going to know what needs to be done right uh, in terms of you should have done all your discounted cost benefit analysis so on and so forth, uh, you should have talked to the experts in the field. Uh, you should have talked to the businesses that are going to be affected, right? And you should have designed your regulation in such a way to maximize sort of 
the benefit, uh, but doing so consistent with both uh, uh, um, the dictates of, of your overseers, in this case OMB, uh, as well as the constrictions put on your activities by law, uh, which is what's going to get you through judicial review. Third, then, let's talk a little bit about some of the basic tools of regulatory design. Now, the first of these that we're going to cover in this lecture is benefit-cost analysis. And what benefit-cost analysis is, is this attempt to sort of list all the costs associated with a, uh, in our case, proposed regulation, as well as all the uh, benefits, right? And that, that may seem an easy thing to do, but in practice it can be quite difficult. And what ends what you need to do effectively is to to do your research right as as somebody writing regulation to go out and talk to the affected parties uh, to sort of determine you know fully what the costs look like uh, and what those amounts roughly might be uh, as well as to sort of ascertain what what some of the benefits might be so for example you might be going to talk to uh, various businesses to determine costs. You might, in the case of environmental regulation, you might be going to talk to various medical professionals to talk about benefits, uh, so on and so forth. You're going to have to go out and to really gather a lot of information. It's not something that you know you're going to find in a textbook. Uh, some terminology over here that 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 we're going to be talking about um, on uh, throughout this course. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but net gain is just the idea, right? That. Um, Actually, I guess I will go through all of them. <laughs> Net gain is the difference between the cost and benefits, right, from the regulation. Uh, Hicksian potential compensation principle is the idea that a anybody who's damaged as a result of the compensation, uh, you know, in sort of terms of lost benefits or something like that or costs, is somehow compensated so that they're equal. Okay, benefit cost ratio is the ratio of benefits and costs, it's very straightforward. Uh, and then finally, the idea that uh, good regulatory design uh, equalizes the marginal benefits and marginal costs. That is, uh, if the marginal benefits of additional regulation are greater than the marginal costs, then, then you should more heavily regulate. And if the uh, costs, marginal costs are greater than the marginal benefit, then the regulation is likely too heavy because the costs uh, associated with the regulation exceeds the benefits to be derived. Okay, here uh, we see sort of graphical representation of that idea. You know, economists love their graphs. I'll admit as an economist, I'm not actually super keen on graphs. I, I kind of try to minimize them as much as possible, but also recognize that visualization sort of help people. So this is the first graph in this series of lectures, so I won't, won't say all this again, but it, it should be said now. Uh, I don't expect people to sort of think that there's some kind of precise, like like if we only got the regulation a little bit different or whatever, somehow, you know, the lines would line up and all the magic would happen and it would be like the perfect regulatory structure. And I also don't want people to think that sort of these lines exist in reality um, because they don't, <laughs> right? Um, they're hypotheticals and they're also ways in which we illustrate relatively complex ideas, right? So if we can think of there being a sort of cost function, we can think of sort of there being a benefit function, then this gives us a way to think about visualizing how those things might might relate to each other. Okay, It gives us a way of sort of thinking about are we regulating too much or too little. Uh, but the idea that we're going to exactly hit uh, you know this maximization point you know from a mathematical perspective uh, is very unlikely. As if that wasn't complicated enough uh, in addition to sort of thinking about costs and benefits, we also have to recognize that these costs and benefits occur at different times, right? So benefits that occur today are, uh, you know, not as valuable as benefits that occur in the far distant future, all things being equal. Same with costs. Now, okay. Over on the left-hand side here, we see, uh, okay, so first off, this is, this is sort of the basics of present value, right? Present form value formulas can get quite complicated depending upon what you're trying to do, okay? What you're trying to derive the present value of and, and how the nature of the benefits and the costs are distributed throughout time, okay? So knowing that here or here is sort of basics, right? Uh, on the left-hand side, we see the summation, right? B is the benefits, marginal benefits. C is the cost, okay? R is the rate of return, okay? And we'll spend a lot of time talking about what the rate of return on capital is and then I is the number of time periods 
Okay, so in this way of looking at the variation between or the differences between the benefits and the cost discounted into the present across all sort of time periods, relevant time periods, we can get some idea of the present value of net benefits. Okay. Okay, now <laughs> I don't like to end on, on a cynical note, uh, uh, but uh, the sort of last thing we should mention is is this idea of capture theory. Okay, and capture theory is, is an idea that economists came up with some decades ago. Uh, and, and it's the idea that sort of regulatory agencies become subservient to the interests that they regulate. Um, now, as a former regulator myself, I find this idea offensive. I'm just going to get that out there. Uh, and, and I find it offensive because uh, you know, when I was working as a regulator, the idea that somehow I was captured by those that I regulate uh, is insulting. <laughs> um, you know, I was there to do a job, right? And I was there to do a job for the people uh, uh, in the country I was working for. And um, uh, that's to me just being a professional. Um, and uh, it, to do otherwise would, 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 would not be professional. But anyway, you're going to hear this idea, right? And economists, um, economists have come with this idea that sort of, uh, you know, what what regulators, what can happen to regulatory agencies is they can become captured by the industry. And and what we mean by this is that they serve the interests of the industry. So, for example, if I'm regulating, say, the trucking industry, that that uh, the regulatory agency comes to be controlled by the trucking agency uh, and does the trucking agency's bidding. Now the rationale for that is this idea that if the trucking agency continues, right, and it continues to have some issues, then the regulatory agency condition continues and everybody's jobs are sort of safe, <laughs> right? And that's why I say it's a very cynical uh, sort of take on regulation. Um, but I'm sure there are examples of regulatory agencies that have been captured over time. Um, but again, as, as, as a former regulator, I, I find the idea highly offensive. Um, but there we go. In reality, uh, regulators and regulatory agencies are likely to be influenced by a variety of influences, right? So, uh, you know, my own sort of work, right, uh, is sort of you know, doing sort of doing what what's right, right, um, is was my primary motivation, and all the regulators I worked with, that was their primary motivation too, uh, virtually without exception. Um, but there are others maybe who have who have other object objectives. Um, I, I you know I obviously not sampled them all, so I couldn't say, uh, but uh, but that that's that's highly likely. Okay, well I feel like I've gone for a long time on this one, and that's just about time for the end. So. So thanks everybody for bearing with me on this one. Uh, we'll see you again next time when we really start to get into the, um, the, the core material for this course. Thanks much everybody. See you then. Bye.